virtual dialogue on the Southeast Asian Nuclear Weapon Free Zone Treaty, its protocol and the way ahead. Before briefly introducing our distinguished speakers, um, let me just go over the rules of the meeting. I kindly ask that all participants, with the exception of course of the speakers, uh, to uh, mute your microphones and uh, disable your cameras. Um, the meeting is on record and it is falls under the implementation of Action 5 of the United Nations Secretary General Agenda for Disarmament uh, Serving Our Common Future. Um, and for that purpose, I think it is a really important meeting to also share with others who cannot uh, be uh, with us today. Um, we will first receive two opening statements, uh, first by uh, Her um, Excellency, the United Nations Under Secretary General and High Representative for Disarmament Affairs, uh, Ms. Zumi Nakamitsu, followed by uh, Dr. William Potter, uh, the founding director of the James Martin Center for Nonproliferation at the Middlebury Institute of International Studies. Um, after that, I will make a brief presentation on the role of nuclear weapon free zones in the nuclear non-proliferation disarmament regime with specific emphasis on the Southeast Asian Treaty. And then we will go into the main feature of today's event, and that is a panel discussion with the emphasis on discussion uh, between four notable experts. So without further uh, delay, uh, I would, I'm very pleased to uh, introduce our two opening uh, speakers. First, as I said, the Under Secretary General and High Representative for Disarmament Affairs, Ms. Inzu Nakamitsu, uh, who has been in this position since May of 2017. Um, Ms. Nakamitsu is a long serving UN official, uh, having served in a variety of positions, but she is also uh, an academic background, um, having been a professor of international relations. Um, at the Hitu Subatsu University in Tokyo, um, and also a member of the uh, Foreign Exchange Council for Japan, uh, amongst many, many other um, important uh, positions. Following her opening statement, I will ask uh, the, my boss and the director of the James Martin Center for Nonproliferation Studies uh, to make his remarks, uh, Dr. William Potter, um, established the James Martin Center more than 30 years ago. Uh, he was trained as a Soviet specialist, uh, but he focuses um, most of his time these days, in addition to US-Russian uh, relations on um, negotiations in the context of the NPT, but um, also was a, played a key role in the establishment of the Central Asian nuclear weapon free zone. And I know from experience that the concept of nuclear weapon free zones is very close to him. So um, with that very, very brief introduction to our two uh, opening speakers, I ask the high representative to start uh, our seminar this afternoon. Ms. Nakamishi, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, distinguished panelists, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. It is my great pleasure to participate in this event, co-organized with our dear friends and colleagues, of course, from the James Martin Center for Non-Proliferation Studies. The purpose of today's event is to refocus the spotlight on the Southeast Asia Nuclear Weapon Free Zone, also known as the Bangkok Treaty. Negotiated in 1995, the Bangkok Treaty was the third nuclear weapon free zone to be established and takes its roots from the 1971 declaration by ASEAN states on the zone of peace, freedom and neutrality. Yet more than a quarter of a century after its negotiation, the treaty remains unable to fulfill its potential, largely due to the ongoing impasse related to the signature and ratification of the treaty's protocol by the nuclear weapon states. This is unfortunate because the Treaty of Bangkok is an essential element of the wide array of um, cooperation modalities and agreements in Southeast Asia, all united under the umbrella 
that is the uh, com comprehensive ASEAN framework. Preserving Southeast Asia as a region free from nuclear weapons and other weapons of mass destruction has remained a consistent priority for ASEAN member states and has been duly reflected as such in the corresponding plans of action for the full implementation of the treaty's provisions. Those provisions fully reinforce the three pillars of the NPT, nuclear disarmament, non-proliferation, and peaceful uses of nuclear energy, of course, and reflects uh, its state party's strong support for the NPT as the centerpiece of a global nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation regime. The relationship between nuclear weapon free zones and the NPT is a mutually reinforcing one, as provided for under Article 7 of the latter. It is a relationship that plays a key role in fulfilling the NPT's purpose, pursuit of a world free of nuclear weapons, and is reflected in the fact that nuclear weapon free zones such as Southeast Asia are invited by NPT states parties to provide updates on their activities to the NPT's review conference. Now, more recently, ASEAN states have played a leading role in efforts to highlight the catastrophic humanitarian consequences of any use of nuclear weapons, and also in the negotiation of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Both are consistent with the Bangkok Treaty's commitment to complete disarmament of nuclear weapons. ASEAN states have played key roles in preparations for the treaty's first meeting of the states parties. The Treaty of Bangkok is an indispensable tool for advancing global efforts to achieve a nuclear weapon-free world and enhance global and regional peace and security. It is therefore urgent to find a way to breach the divergent positions between ASEAN and the nuclear weapon states regarding the signature and ratification of the Southeast Asia Nuclear Weapon Free Zone Protocol. Ratification of the protocol would allow the zone to achieve its full potential. It would improve the security not only of states' parties, but also the nuclear weapon states, as it would both ensure the Southeast Asia would not be a threat of um, nuclear competition and help to reduce nuclear risks in the region. Given the current geopolitical climate, one which, in which nuclear weapon states are engaged in increasingly dangerous patterns of behavior that have driven nuclear risks to heights not seen since the 1980s, these will be welcome benefits indeed. Of course, the issues related to signature and ratification of the protocol are complicated and the prerogative of states parties and the nuclear weapon states. However, I hope that parties will both continue their current dialogues and find ways to accelerate them. As always, the UN Office for Disarmament Affairs stands ready to help however it can. To that end, UNODA remains committed to supporting nuclear weapon free zone treaties, including by strengthening communication and cooperation between them to leverage each of their individual strengths. UN Secretary General Guterres, in his agenda for disarmament, securing our common future, recognize the zone as landmark instruments that represent an excellent example of the synergy between regional and global efforts towards a world free of nuclear weapons. I wish you most productive discussion at this webinar, and I hope that it will provide impetus and generate new ideas on how to advance the objectives of the Bangkok Treaty. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, High Representative, um, and also I'd like to reiterate or underline your call that um, the way forward in this treaty is uh, for 
efforts to be made between the parties of the treaty as well as the nuclear weapon states. And I wish also to thank you for the unwavering support that your department has given, not only to the whole global issue of nuclear disarmament, but in particular nuclear weapon free zones that is dear to many of us. Um, and I would like to particularly thank through you, uh, your colleagues, Chris King and Gavin Lomelin for working with us uh, to organize this event. Uh, now I'd like to invite uh, the, the director of James Martin Center for Non-Proliferation Studies, Dr. William Potter. Thank you very much, Jean. Uh, it's my honor and great pleasure to join High Representative Izumi Nakamitsu in welcoming you to our workshop this afternoon. Uh, I regard nuclear weapons-free zones to be one of the most important but often overlooked approaches for promoting both disarmament and non-proliferation. As such, I'm delighted to have CNS partner with UNODA to convene this very timely meeting to raise awareness about the Southeast Asia nuclear weapons-free zone and to explore practical measures for accelerating the signing and ratification of the protocol to the treaty. As I'm sure many of you are aware, the idea for strengthening regional security by establishing a geographical space free of nuclear weapons can be traced back at least as far as the mid-1950s. It was the 1967 Treaty of Tlatelolco in Latin America and the Caribbean, however, that for the first time created a nuclear weapons-free zone in a densely populated area. Significantly, before the NPT was negotiated. This regional treaty was followed by nuclear weapons-free zones in the South Pacific, the Treaty of Rarotonga in 1985, uh, in Southeast Asia, the Bangkok Treaty in 1995, in Africa, the Pelandaba Treaty in 1996, and in Central Asia in 2006. Nuclear weapons-free zones reinforced the NPT and advanced nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation in a variety of ways uh, when they are implemented faithfully. They do so by a combination of legally binding prohibitions, altering threat perceptions, fostering confidence-building measures, and reinforcing nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation norms. Although most legal prohibitions apply to non-nuclear weapon states parties to nuclear weapons free zones. Nuclear weapons free zones that conclude protocols to zones not only agree to respect the terms of the zones, but also assume legal obligations not to use nuclear weapons against or threaten the member states with nuclear weapons, thereby reinforcing the principle of negative security assurances. Regrettably, the force of these commitments by nuclear weapon states often are diluted by reservations and or interpretive statements made in conjunction with their conclusion of the protocols. It also is the case that while nuclear weapon states typically express their support in general for nuclear weapons free zones, in practice, they often have a hard time finding zones that they actually like. As a consequence of these factors, there usually is a long lag time between the entry into force of a zone and the conclusion of protocols to the treaties by all relevant nuclear weapon states. Although the Southeast Asia Nuclear Weapons Free Zone Treaty is not unique in this respect, it's indicative of the larger problem of meeting the demands of both the non-nuclear weapon states in the region and the concerns of nuclear weapon states. I don't expect us to, revolve, to resolve either the more general problem or the specific case of the Southeast Asia Nuclear Weapons Free Zone Treaty today. But I do hope that our excellent group of speakers will provide us with some useful suggestions for making headway in advance of the next international conference on nuclear weapons free zones and before we meet for the long delayed 10th NPT uh, review conference. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bill, um, for your uh, opening remarks and also a, a, for sort of a flash overview of where we stand with treaties. The, the advantage of speaking after your boss and a, and a very highly respected expert um, is that when you have to make your presentation, then that he's 
he's already set you up and you, don't, you can keep your remarks even shorter. So thank you, Bob, for, for doing that. Um, so thank you very much to our opening speakers. I think we are off to a good start. Um, I will now uh, provide a brief um, presentation on Uh, can you see the slides? Yes. Just one slide, Tim. Uh, yes, just one, yeah. So it's a full screen slide. You don't see all the other slides? No. Correct. Okay, thank you. Um, so, um, so clearly a map tells a story, uh, and I want to focus on the zonal approach. So um, the nuclear weapon free zones um, are defined by the United Nations as internationally binding agreements amongst a group of states um, that represent uh, their commitment not to develop, manufacture, control, possess uh, and nuclear weapons on their territories or territories controlled by them. Obviously, these are all non-nuclear weapon states, so the emphasis, as uh, also the high representative point out, the, the responsibility is on the nuclear weapon states. Um, nuclear weapon states like the NPT um, permits obviously peaceful uses of nuclear energy and science. But I think the best definition to me of nuclear weapon free zones is that it's a zonal approach um, that would lead to the global em elimination of nuclear weapons, as was stated by um, the foreign minister of Mexico, uh, Alfonso Garcia Robles, and he partly for, for this initiative, which led to the Tlatelolco Treaty, uh, won the uh, Nobel Peace Prize. Just a little lighthearted, uh, often if you go to, to cities, and I'm sure uh, in, in Australia and in New Zealand, we have two of our panelists from there. I know just north of us here in Santa Cruz, uh, there's a sign that this is a nuclear weapon free or nuclear free zone. These are uh, clearly not the kind of zones that we're talking about, although they are of political importance. Um, as Dr. Potter already uh, mentioned, it all started way back, uh, even before uh, the Tlatel Loco Treaty. Of course, the Cuban Missile Crisis provided um, a serious wake-up call, uh, not only to uh, the Latin American and Caribbean region, but also um, to uh, the, the international community. And uh, soon after that, of course, the Tatu Loco Treaty was started. What I find fascinating, however, as someone from uh, South Africa, um, is that the French testing and also the testing in the uh, South Pacific inspired a lot of countries, uh, including in Africa and in the Pacific, to take actions uh, that eventually led to the establishment of uh, nuclear weapon free zones in those regions. Um, all the nuclear weapon free zones uh, succeeded, followed the, the uh, Treaty of Tartaloco, and what, this is a slide, very busy slide, it's not my purpose to go through it, but I, I thought it might be of interest to you to see the, the development over history. And what I find fascinating is that uh, the, there's a progressive set of obligations under each of the of the zones, starting from Tlatelolco, which had, if you wish, some loopholes in it that were later fixed, ending up with a Central Asian zone uh, that requires uh, the additional protocol in addition to comprehensive safeguards, adherence to these the ratification of the CTBT, etc. Um, of course, there are a variety of criteria that was established uh, by uh, the uh, United Nations um, uh, way back in 1975, um, further strengthened by SE 71 in 1978. Um, very importantly, that the initiative must come from the states in the region concerned. It must be legally binding treaties. There must clearly be a total absence of nuclear weapons and uh, must be verified. Um, it must be a geographically defined zone and recognized by the General Assembly. 
Um, one of the last, in fact, I think it is the last um, agreement that the UNDC uh, took uh, on nuclear weapons related issue, nuclear disarmament related issue, was to establish guidelines for nuclear weapon free, uh, free zones. Um, there are many, uh, I just highlight a few, which I think is particularly interesting for the Southeast Asia zone. Um, nuclear weapon states and states international responsible for territories within the zone should be consulted. It should be in conformity with international law, including the United Nations law of the sea. They must, states are free to decide passage on foreign vessels and nuclear weapon states should enter into legally, legally binding commitments not to use or threaten to use nuclear weapons um, in the states belonging to the, to the zone. What is interesting, and I think it's also useful, um, I don't have, and I've not seen it published, but the United States um, have seven criteria that it measures its participation and commitment to the zones. Um, and as it is also, although not a influencing party to the negotiations, um, the United States has, uh, to the best of my knowledge, been an observer to most of the zonal uh, treaty negotiations. Um, so the the seven um, criteria more or less overlaps with that of the United Nations, with the exception of four and six. Um, of course, it should not infringe on existing security arrangements. Clearly, this is this is NATO in case of the United States, and six, and this is particularly important. Um, also, it should not affect the rights of states to grant or transit. Um, uh, overflights. Um, uh, so I think it's important to to bear this in mind as as one look at um, at not only the Southeast Asian zone but others as well. Um, Dr. Parra already mentioned uh, the relationship with the NPT. I think the, the the most important difference between nuclear weapon free zones and the NPT is that the NPT only uh, prohibits control of nuclear weapons uh, by nuclear weapon states, but they, it, the placement of nuclear weapons on the territories of non-nuclear weapon states is silent. Um, and this is the concept of nuclear sharing, which is of concern to many uh, non-nuclear weapon states today. Um, but to the, con to, and the op uh, opposed, not opposed to it, but uh, reinforcing the NPT is the obligations of nuclear weapon free zones uh, under Article Six and th Art Article Two and Three of the NPT, uh, and as I mentioned, the Central Asian Zone now also requires the additional protocol in addition to comprehensive safeguards. Uh, nuclear weapon free zones is a is a route to achieving complete nuclear disarmament, as envisioned by um, Alfonso Robles. It's definitely complementary to the NPT in terms of transparency, confidence building measures, and negative security assurances, which, as you know, is not part of the NPT. But they can only be fully effective if recognized by nuclear weapon states. And for that reason, all the existing zonal treaties have protocols open for signature and ratification uh, by the states, uh, not to, to place um, weapons, but very importantly, not to threaten members with nuclear weapons. Um, this is a wonderful map prepared by the Office of Disarmament Affairs many years ago, and it's still uh, still valid. It was prepared soon after uh, the Central Asian zone was was uh, negotiated, but it shows you in a, in a one snapshot, um, you know, all the nuclear weapon free zones, including um, the zones that we typically don't consider as we, if we talk about it um, in the outer space, uh, the seabed. Uh, and of course, Antarctic. Um, there are a number of others. Um, very importantly, M Mongolia declared itself a single state zone. Um, and of course, there is also the uh, 4 plus 2 treaty uh, that was agreed between um, uh, President Bush and, and Secretary Gorbachev. But I would like to jump. Um, this is proposed zone, so we all know the problems with the Middle East. This is not the point of this discussion, but I think it's important to at least recognize that there are a number of proposed zones that uh, some of them have long been forgotten, and of course the Middle East zone is still being pursued. Um, this is just very, very briefly uh, to show the 
uh, different, different zones. Um, it's in interesting if one looks at the zone of application uh, and how the zones have been defined. Uh, so the Latin American zone, of course, latitude, longitude lines, um, covers a vast area of the um, Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. Um, uh, and uh, this one is the only zone, zonal treaty where all the protocols uh, have been uh, signed and ratified by the nuclear states. The South Pacific zone um, established in direct uh, reaction to nuclear weapon tests. Um, and of course, that's why it focuses on that as well. Um, very interesting to me always is that not all the nuclear weapon states have ratified um, the, the treaties, uh, most notably uh, the United States. Um, there are, of course, domestic political reasons for that in the United States, but it is something worth noting. Again, look at the uh, zone of application, very, very large parts of the ocean uh, is included. Uh, Treaty of Pelindaba, which is very close to me, having uh, participated in the final round of negotiations. Uh, again, it, it builds on previous treaties. It includes a prohibition on weapons research, obviously given the South African um, connect, connection it established in a commission on nuclear energy. Um, and it has three protocols, two of uh, which are related to nuclear weapon states. Again, uh, the United States have not ratified uh, those two. Um, but again, I have to say this is mainly due to domestic uh, politics here in the United States. Um, and then the Central Asian zone, the, the most modern, if you wish, although this has already been many years since it was concluded. Again, it built on the previous treaties, but this, in this case, it's a significant treaty. It is wedged between nuclear weapon states. Um, it requires not only the comprehensive safeguards, but the additional protocol and compliance with the CTBT. Um, and it all adds another element about um, re environmental rehabilitation, uh, given the, the consequences of not only nuclear weapon testing, but nuclear uh, weapon material development in, um, in that, uh, that region. Um, it, it has a very interesting clause in it and that it allows for a future expansion. I always ask my students or fellows that come, you know, where, which is the most obvious country other than Afghanistan that it can be, can expand to, and that can only be Iran, which obviously will lead to some interesting discussions. Then finally, Treaty of Bangkok. Um, as was already pointed out, um, the Treaty of Bangkok was signed as a result of the uh, discussions on a, a zone of peace, freedom, and neutrality, Zopfan, uh, eventually uh, entered into force in 1997, um, covers territories and continental shelves, as well as the economic zones of the state's parties to the zone. And, and, and so this is, this is where the problem lies. Um, very interesting, um, it decide, states should decide for themselves whether to allow passage of, of foreign vessels, including um, those potentially carrying nuclear weapons, and it bans the dumping of radioactive waste, so very important. Like the African zone, uh, it includes a commission uh, that oversees implementation, which in part also creates a part of the problem. Um, and so nuclear weapon states are mainly concerned that the zone of application includes the EEZs of the contracting parties, uh, which especially in the South China Sea is not clearly defined. Um, and the new negative security assurance uh, requirement uh, implies a commitment by nuclear weapon states not to use weapons against any contracting party within the zone, which um, led most all the nuclear weapon states uh, not to have ratified this. Um, there are basically four concerns in my uh, research that show why the nuclear weapon states uh, do not wish to ratify. Uh, one is the negative security assurance. The United States, for instance, in terms of its uh, nuclear posture review, um, keeps the option, op option open to threaten or use nuclear weapons against states, uh, non-nuclear weapon states, that 
are in uh, not in compliance with their non-proliferation obligations. Of course, there are also um, nuclear weapon uh, capable states or states with nuclear weapons, uh, such as uh, North Korea, that can operate within that um, uh, economic zones. Uh, a second concern is that the free movement of nuclear armed vessels within the zone. Uh, given uh, the area and also proximity to the South China Sea, uh, this is of concern uh, to the nuclear weapon states, again, also the United States. Given the EEZ inclusion, um, the nuclear weapon states consider that it undermines their capability uh, to launch nuclear weapons from within the zone. And finally, um, the exact boundaries of the zone um, are unclear and create potential problems uh, for even countries within the zone uh, that could lead to um, disputes of a, a territorial sovereignty. Uh, examples, there are at least four ASEAN countries, uh, Philippines, Vietnam, Malaysia, and Brunei, um, that have unresolved maritime territorial disputes uh, and a fifth country, Indonesia, um, does not claim any sovereign sovereignty over land in the South China Sea, uh, but, it, um, but its claimed economic zone overlaps with the claims of some of the uh, aforementioned countries. To conclude, all parties, in my view, including the Southeast Asian countries and the nuclear weapon states, should exercise political flexibility and resolve these outstanding issues. Um, there have been a number of opportunities. Uh, the Asian ASEAN Summit uh, last, last year um, reiterated ASEAN's commitment to zone. Uh, the commission met um, and uh, included a action plan and a communique. And of course, there is the General Assembly resolution. Um, now, I say this in respect as well, especially someone who has spent many, many years of my career in the first committee. But the Yunga resolution uh, that was adopted um, in 2019 is simply a bookmark resolution just to place it on the agenda again for, for, the, for this year. Um, and I wonder if more cannot be done. And with that, I think we can hopefully listen to our panelists uh, that will provide us some answers to these pressing questions. So I will stop my presenting. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, it's now my distinctive honor and pleasure to introduce uh, our panel. So uh, in the order of uh, how they were um, advertised in the, in the pamphlet, uh, let me firstly uh, welcome Ambassador Tim Corley, a uh, longtime friend and colleague. Uh, Tim is the non-resident senior fellow and was a resident senior fellow uh, at the the United Nations uh, Institute for Disarmament uh, Research, and uh, he was also the director of the United Nations Office of Disarmament in Geneva, the Deputy Secretary General of the Conference on Disarmament, and very importantly, uh, Disarmament Ambassador and Permanent Representative of New Zealand uh, in uh, Geneva. Uh, secondly, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Mendenhall, uh, who is um, uh, Assistant Professor at the University of Rhode Island in the Department of Marine Affairs. And I'm particularly pleased that we have uh, a maritime law expert with us, uh, given the implications of um, the, the economic zones and, and um, everything else that goes with that. Um, uh, Elizabeth has um, uh, done quite a bit of work in this field. Uh, she is uh, as a research focuses on progressive development of ocean governance, especially in the context of uh, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. Uh, fourth panelist um, is Associate Professor Dr. Marian Hansen. Uh, she is with the University of Queensland and the uh, School of Political Science and International Studies. Uh, Dr. Hansen um, 
before she joined, uh, she was also a visiting scholar at the Liu Center for Study on Global Issues uh, and in the University of British Columbia. Um, her research interest is quite wide, ranging from a number of international security issues, also in the context of NATO, OEC, uh, and the ICC. And finally, but not least, uh, I welcome Dr. Uh, Ho Chi Ping. She's a senior lecturer at uh, the Research Center for History, Politics, and International Affairs um, at the University of Kevanankang uh, in Malaysia. So uh, with that, uh, very brief introductions and in no means uh, mean to uh, uh, diminish the importance of our panel. Uh, I will ask that they each make a very brief introduction uh, to the topic, and then we will go into kind of a discussion uh, following a number of um, leading questions. So, uh, Tim, shall I ask you to start off, please? Thank you very much, Sean. Thank, thank you all. Uh, thank you to um, James Martin Center and to ODA for inviting me on the panel. Um, perhaps, John, it would be helpful if I made a few uh, initial comments um, on, on one particular um, aspect that I think is standing um, between, um, uh, is preventing perhaps fulfillment of the potential of the Bangkok Treaty, to use um, the words of the High Representative in her opening remarks. And that is the fact, uh, as you yourself have, have also mentioned, uh, uh, the uh, reality that the protocol to the Bangkok Treaty um, has uh, has not drawn any support to, to date from the five nuclear weapon states, and um, the, the the reasons for this, I think, again have been already set out. We might discuss them more fully uh, during the course of uh, of this webinar, but. Um, it's clear that uh, the Bangkok Treaty, um, both in itself and in, in relative to the other uh, nuclear weapon-free zones, is an ambitious one. Uh, and um, it, it seems to me that the level of ambition of the parties to the Bangkok Treaty is both admirable, um, but also a, a possible um, barrier to finding uh, a way forward to uh, um, realize the potential of, of the treaty. And I say that um, because I think it, it means that the scope for actual renegotiation um, of the treaty is extremely limited. Um, but uh, that's not to say that there is uh, no hope for, um, for finding a, a way forward. And I think um, there is. Uh, the question is, what would be um, a, an appropriate um, vehicle for um, such a, a, a way forward, a way in which um, the parties to the treaty uh, itself and the five nuclear weapon states could find some common ground? Um, I uh, see that one such vehicle might be through the making of uh, reservations on the part of the nuclear weapon um, states to the protocol. It is a matter that some of them, at least perhaps all of them, um, have been considering. And I think it is a matter also that has been um, discussed with the, the, the treaty parties. Um, to date, uh, unlike uh, in the case of the other nuclear weapon-free zones, uh, no reservations um, have been tabled, and indeed um, the, uh, the, the status of the um, protocol to an extent therefore remains um, pristine. But I, I will leave it there, but could come back um, to discussing uh, in, in more detail if, if it seems appropriate. Um, the kind of reservations that might be made and perhaps also uh, comment on um, the international legal uh, complications of, of reservations in this particular situation. Thanks very much. Thank you, Tim. I would be very interested in those uh, those thoughts because I think that's probably the answer to the, the, the riddle. Uh, Elizabeth. 
Sure, hello. Um, so I'm Elizabeth Mendenhall. Uh, my PhD is in international relations, but my expertise is the history and development of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, unclose. Um, so I came to the topic of nuclear weapons free zones by way of the Seabed Arms Control Treaty of 1972, which is often forgotten, but bans the emplacement of weapons of mass destruction on the seabed beyond 12 nautical miles. Um, China, Russia, uh, the U.S. and the U.K. are all members of this treaty, which I think will be relevant to our discussion later. Um, but I'm also very interested in questions about the legality of transit for nuclear powered and or nuclear armed vessels, both in terms of the Bangkok Treaty, but also UNCLOSE. Um, last year, I undertook something of a survey. Um, I published a paper in Strategic Studies Quarterly, which just ex analyzed the existing nuclear weapons free zones focusing especially on the role of nuclear weapon states in sort of making or breaking um, the existence and effectiveness of these zones. So the, the topic has been on my mind lately, although it's not my main focus of research. As far as the Bangkok Treaty, um, I'm most knowledgeable about regional maritime dynamics, especially in terms of the interacting uh, nuclear strategies of the US and China and also the obvious and also potential interactions between this treaty and the law of the sea. So as an opening statement, I just wanna express that I, I find it very hard to understand why this nuclear weapons free zone explicitly includes the continental shelf and exclusive economic zone of member states. To me, this invites a lot of conflict and controversy for not much additional nuclear security. And unfortunately, it also indelibly ties the debate over the Bangkok Treaty with ongoing disagreements about how to interpret some of the basic provisions of UNCLOSE. So I'm very much looking forward uh, to getting into that. And I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, that was um, already very insightful. So uh, the next uh, panelist to in briefly introduce uh, the topic is Dr. Hansen. Thank you and hello everybody and I appreciate the opportunity to be on this panel. Um, just in my opening remarks, I would like to say that I think that the obstacles that exist with this treaty can be overcome. Um, I've actually, in my research in preparation for this, I'm struck by the fact that Strategic conditions have changed considerably um, over the past 10 years, especially. Uh, I think that the relationship between China and ASEAN is now better than it was, say, 10 years ago. Um, but I also believe that the if we sort of get right down to the, the nitty gritty of the challenges, including the exclusive economic zone, the uh, legally binding uh, negative security assurances. I think all of these can be pulled apart and with a degree of compromise and goodwill by all parties, this can be done. Thank you. Uh... And I, I fully share that, that thought. Um, then the last panelist to introduce herself and the topic uh, will be Dr. Xu Ping Hu. Uh, I will thank you so much. I would like to thank um, James Martin Center and also Yunoda for um, having this workshop. And I'm very glad to be able to have these conversations with um, fellow colleagues uh, working on the field. And I particularly appreciate the um, different expertise that has been brought into this dialogue. And um, just like what um, Dr. Hansen has said, um, things have changed, um, but we may disagree on the uh, strategic condition that is currently unfold in the so-called Indo-Pacific region. So um, in regards to um, the nuclear weapons um, free zones, um, the protocols and its implementation, so everyone understands that um, Southeast Asia is a very diverse region and uh, collectively we are known as a group of um, um, smaller states um, and uh, small powers and there is a huge expectation that um, 
a collective um, group of uh, small states can influence a major powers um, decision or policy trajectory. So what I would like to bring to um, the discussion today is about how um, the voices from the non-nuclear weapon states can bring to the table and perhaps we can enact a kind of a um, to create international norms in this process by um, having this um, open-minded um, um, discussion and uh, how we can instill a kind of um, um, to remove this culture of shifting blames uh, when it comes to the conflicts and controversies surrounding uh, creating a new uh, international regime. Thank you so much. Thank you. I think all four uh, of our panelists have already teed us up uh, for a very good discussion, especially uh, suggesting that there are opportunities to uh, look at the provisions of the treaty, uh, both uh, from the perspective of the parties to the, to the treaty, but also the nuclear weapon states, uh, taking into account um, that, you know, whether the um, economic zones in the continental shelf the inclusion of that actually makes a difference. Um, and you know, we also need to consider what is the, the threat, especially in that particular uh, region. Um, my, my observation simply is, is that this zone um, is a key part of the global effort uh, with nuclear weapon free zones. And uh, I look forward to finding some ways that we can go back to Alfonso Robles' vision. Before uh, starting the conversation, let me invite uh, our many uh, participants in the audience. If you wish to ask a question, um, please use your virtual hand uh, to um, identify yourself between myself and colleagues at the Office of Disarmament Affairs and also our panelists. We will monitor um, the, the uh, questions. And then uh, if you wish to ask your question in person, we will allow you to do so. I ask that you do so briefly. So the very first uh, question that I want to put to our panelists is how do you see the regional complexities, and some of you alluded to that already, in the general political context surrounding the treaty uh, to facilitate or um, inhibit its implementation? Who wish to go first here? Elizabeth, please. Thank you. Um, so all you need to say is South China Sea, and you know that things are going to get more complicated. Um, this is an area with a high density of ocean uses and ocean users. It includes important routes, important resources, and it's very international in terms of its importance. So all this value means that there's a desire for control and a desire for access on the part of maritime states, many of whom are also the nuclear weapon states like the US. Um, there are major barriers in the region to delimiting maritime space. This is especially the case in the continental shelf, but also true for exclusive economic zones. And those who aren't familiar, there's a different set of rules for the water column and the sea surface. That's the exclusive economic zone or EEZ compared to the continental shelf. And there are cases where the continental shelf can extend beyond the exclusive economic zone. So in short, it's, it's very unclear who controls which parts of the South China Sea. And because delimitation processes take so much time, it's not likely to be clear anytime soon. Uh, the South China Sea is also an important arena of competition for China and the United States. China is incrementally pursuing a strategy of anti-access and area denial while the United States remains fundamentally committed to maritime access. I'm not trying to be purely pessimistic here about the difficulties of especially this maritime region. I mean, clearly there are some advantages over existing and potential nuclear weapons free zones in terms of sort of the relative degree of cohesion among ASEAN, ASEAN member states, the lack of you know, middle power regional animosities, a good track record of regional cooperation. But when it comes to these maritime issues, that strength can also be a weakness um, because there is a fair amount of cohesion among Southeast Asian states about interpreting restrictions on maritime transit. Um, so this concerns concepts like innocent passage and transit passage, as well as free navigation and the exclusive economic zone. And there just isn't consensus on exactly what these terms mean. But 
if you look at the sort of um, breadth of opinion in the international community, Southeast Asian states are more, um, they tend to be more on the side of restrictions imposed by coastal states. So for example, um, are warships innocent passage? Um, Indonesia believes that any warship needs prior notification in order for the passage to be innocent. Vietnam, the Philippines, China, Myanmar, Cambodia, they all believe prior authorization is necessary for a warship to have innocent passage. All of those views are clearly opposed by Russia, the US, France, the United Kingdom. Um, and so that cohesion, that restrictions are possible, coastal states have the right to restrict transit that exists in this law of the sea realm is sort of a, a benefit in terms of regional negotiation, getting on the same page, but it's creating a challenge in terms of communication with nuclear weapon states over restrictions on maritime transit. Um, just one more point about the specifics of this region, including the exclusive economic zone and the continental shelf also means that you cannot separate the issues of the Bangkok Treaty from the question of China's nine dash line claims in the South China Sea. And to call these claims, which are based in, in his history, intractable, that's an, an understatement. I mean, we all saw the arbitral ruling in 2016 and China's reaction to that. Um, and, and, and truthfully, UNCLOS does provide room for historic claims. I'm not taking a position on this particular claim, but this dispute between EEZs and Continental Shelf on one hand and the nine dash line claim on, another, on the other hand, it's a very difficult dispute. And now it's connected to the Bangkok Treaty because of the extension into maritime space. And you're also triggering these major anxieties of the historical maritime states, the US, the United Kingdom and Russia in terms of their maritime hegemony. You know, they made a big deal in the 70s to get normal modes of transit through international straits like the Strait of Malacca. Um, and this, this is seen by them as sort of a threat to something that they've been pushing for for over 50 years. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm here at the event. I, I feel that I, I would think that this is a good thing for the world, but it's just a really tough region, especially when you extend the Bangkok Treaty into maritime space. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, very important points. Uh, anyone else on the panel would like to comment on on the regional complexities um, before we move on to yes, Marianne. Yes, I just want a little bit of clarification, and I defer to um, Elizabeth's extensive knowledge here. But the problem isn't so much the uh, ships or, or uh, maritime vessels going through territorial waters. That that is what would require notification, presumably. But that is also being requested for the EEZ part of the ocean, right? So that that's a key issue. Um, I think that the the case, the South China Sea complicates this tremendously, but it's also fascinating to me that China has seemed to be uh, the state most open to signing the protocol, uh, certainly on previous occasions, and I think at the moment also. And I'm wondering the extent to which there has already been some compromise reached between China and ASEAN very informally, not to allow the, the South China Sea complications be, be even more complicated. I mean, I'm, I, you know, again, it would take a lot of legal unpicking and, and analysis, but it does strike me that China of all the nuclear weapon states has actually put forward um, a, a willingness to do this. It's hmm. a very interesting perspective. Uh, yes, Elizabeth, you want to comment yeah, on that? Just a, yeah, just a quick response. That The fact that China is most open to signing the protocol is not at all surprising to me for two reasons. Um, the first is that this, this restrictive interpretation on maritime transit which honestly is even a harder sell in the exclusive economic zone. The Law of the Sea Convention does not provide any room for coastal states to legally restrict passage through the exclusive economic zone. There's one great power who differs in that interpretation, and that's China. In exercising their South China Sea claims, you know, there's a lot of ambiguity and vagueness about what the nine dash line means. 
but they are the ones who will push, well, this is our exclusive economic zone, so you can't do X, Y, and Z. So that's that's reason number one, it's not surprising to me because it fits within their non-standard interpretation of the law of the sea. Reason number two has more to do with nuclear strategy. So if I'm reading the treaty correctly, and I sort of check this with other publications, it seems that it, it surely restricts targeting of nuclear armed vessels within the exclusive economic zone. The, the weapons can't go in and they can't go out, but it doesn't seem to restrict transit of nuclear armed vehicles like SSBNs, nuclear armed submarines. That's, that's perfect for China because that creates a South China Sea nuclear bastion, which is exactly what the Soviet Union pursued during the Cold War and after where their submarines can basically hide and not be targeted, um, but still serve the purpose of strategic deterrence being that secure second strike. So I think China would have some problems with the delimitation of the treaty because those EEZ claims on the continental shelf extend past the nine dash line. But in terms of interpretation of UNCLOSE and nuclear strategy, um, I think your problem is gonna be a lot more the other nuclear weapon states than China. Interesting. Tim uh, and Chiu Ping. Ah, Chiu Ping, please. Uh, many thanks to the input, especially on the um, interpretation of UNCLOS. So firstly, I would like to raise the fact that there are not only nuclear weapon, uh, um, sorry, nuclear armed vessels that is um, passing through South China Sea, but also the nuclear power ships, including submarine. So, um, not only um, this has been a issue of contentions, um, but um, it is exactly because it infringed upon the, um, so there is also a gray area between the um, 12 nautical miles economic um, exclusive um, zones and also the maritime area declared by each of the states. So out of the 10 Southeast Asian countries, um, if um, <laughs> including Timor-Leste 11, um, except for Laos, which is a landlocked country, the rest are coastal um, states. So um, to allow, um, and there is one more issue that has not been addressed in South China Sea is actually the um, fishing zones. So this is actually the white elephant in the South China Sea issue. And um, as for ASEAN, um, we are also obligated by the Proliferation Security Initiative whereby we need to inspect ships that may potentially carry um, dual use technology. So Malaysia has a strategic trade act to deal with the import export of um, um, suspicious um, dual use technology for nuclear weapons development, especially between North Korea and the states in the Middle East. So um, it seems to be um, the, the point about the restriction is um, also allowing us to um, conduct inspection. I will need um, a confirmation from Elizabeth about this. And um, the South China Sea complication, um, I think um, for us to negotiate with each of the major powers of not to bring their <laughs> um, personal political agenda or issues into the discussion of whether nuclear weapon free zones or even the recently um, we sign on to the Treaty of Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, uh, TPNW. Um, it seems to be um, counterintuitive to the fact that uh, none of the security issues is exclusive anymore. They are bound to spill over into other security aspects. And in this um, area is about um, how nuclear free can a zombie? <laughs> so, and this is what the problems are uh, about the protocols is about. Thank you. Um, Tim, do you wish to add to this or shall we move into the next question? Yeah, let's move into the next question. It's, it's pretty hard yeah. to add to obviously what's a very daunting Sorry. security situation, but um, but nonetheless, we we have to uh, try and be inventive here, and um, and I think that's uh, that may come out in the in the following questions. Absolutely, I mean, based on this discussion, which is really rich in, in content, um, and also comments that uh, both Tim um, and especially Elizabeth made in the introduction remark is 
how would you, what are the key concerns and challenges related to nuclear weapon states signing and ratifying of the protocols to the, to the treaty? And what are the political ramifications for the treaty effectiveness in accepting reservations by a nuclear weapon states? Uh, Tim, you particularly refer to that. Uh, Elizabeth, you mentioned that the um, EEZs and the continental shelf actually, you know, including in the treaty, do not really add uh, much as far as the security elements of the treaty. So, um, I don't know, Tim, will you want to lead off on this discussion? Yeah, okay, John. Well, I mean, to go to go um, straight into the the detail of this. I mean, Article Article Two of the Protocol to the Bangkok Treaty um, uh, places an obligation on on nuclear weapon states parties to the protocol once they become party um, to apply security assurances, <clears throat> a, a guarantee that is by them not to use or threaten to use nuclear weapons um, against the non nuclear weapon states. Uh, the, what we know as, as negative security assurances. Uh, under the protocol, um, these assurances uh, in, in the Bangkok Treaty uh, are directed not only vis-a-vis -vis the parties to the treaty, but also uh, in the zone itself. And this, this is a, a fairly, as I mentioned, ambitious at the, in my earlier comments. This, this goes quite a way beyond, for instance, the Treaty of Taradaloko, um, where the five nuclear weapon states simply undertake not to use or, or threaten to use nuclear weapons against the, the parties to, to that treaty. Um, now, um, in that particular case, in the Treaty of Tehidaloko, and nonetheless, a, a relatively simple, um, uh, straightforward seeming um, uh, provision, the nuclear weapon states, except China, made declarations um, with certain restrictive uh, effects when they when they signed the relative uh, protocol, um, and um, this raises, uh, to my mind, um, quite a, an interesting question in, in international law: the question of making um, reservations uh, when um, <clears throat> there is. Uh, a, 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 an explicit uh, reference um, in, in the treaty that no such reservations um, uh, can be made. Now, um, the, uh, the, the, the the situation that, that this um, places the treaty parties in is, is whether to um, nonetheless, if you like, turn a, a, a blind eye to um, uh, to, to the to the uh, article uh, restricting um, reservations uh, and uh, allow uh, reservations to be made um, of, of some form that um, uh, would need to be uh, sufficiently, um, shall we say, moderate, uh, so as not to. Um, uh, cut against the uh, the object and purpose of the um, uh, uh, <clears throat> of the relevant um, uh, article. Now, um, this might be the case in, in relation to the uh, second aspect of the um, of the um, article relating to the not, not to use. Um, weapons not not to use or threaten to use weapons within the the zone itself but um, in terms of the application to the EZ and the and the continental shelf which is uh, something new to these um, zones that that wasn't as explicit in the uh, in in its predecessors then I think it would be very difficult to find a way that would um, uh, uh, avoid that objection that such a, a reservation would go um, against the the object and purpose um, of the treaty. Now, um, nonetheless, uh, in the in the uh, NPT, for instance, and uh, and uh, I think also in the uh, first committee of the General Assembly, um, the non-aligned um, countries and calling for. Um, reservations and, and declarations and so forth to be removed um, have have not been too specific in in, in what um, 
those reservations and declarations related to. And it may be that uh, there's a glimmer in that of uh, finding some sort of um, uh, accommodation that would allow both the uh, treaty parties um, on the one hand and the nuclear weapon states on the other um, to find a, um, a, 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 a middle way um, to allow um, uh, the nuclear weapon states to overcome their um, objections uh, on the one hand to the um, to the language of the treaty, but on the other um, uh, satisfy the, uh, the the treaty parties that by and large their ambitions uh, are being um, at, at least respected, if if not an, entirely met. And of course. Uh, as I've already implied, in, uh, reservations aren't forever. They they can be removed over time um, once the parties are, are, are more confident amongst themselves. But uh, again, we do come back to, to the real world um, in which, um, uh, as we've already seen, the, uh, <clears throat> the security situation is a very challenging one. Thank you, Tim. Um, Marion. Thank you. Um, it's quite important, I think, for the ASEAN states and the non-line movement more broadly to feel that the ZOP plan is being respected and the, the nuclear weapon free zone is being uh, respected by the nuclear weapon states. And I, the sense I get is that there is quite a lot of reluctance to accepting uh, reservations there are a couple of things that I'd like to note here. First of all, I think that the nuclear weapon states are perhaps expecting too much. I think, and, and by allowing them to, to sort of put all these reservations in place or object to the negative security assurances or object to the fact that they cannot launch a nuclear weapon against uh, another nuclear state, even in the region, et cetera. I think we, we're, there's a danger here of continuing with the same old strategic mindset and confirming that nuclear weapons have a lot of utility. It seems to me, for example, that if there is an SSBN or a, a, a Russian um, nuclear vessel and the US for some reason determines that it has to attack that, it doesn't require a nuclear weapon to do so. The treaty does not prohibit the use of conventional weapons and let's face it, the conventional capabilities of yeah. the United States and the other states are quite significant. So I'm not a hundred percent sure that I you know, would want to dilute those those um, provisions too much. I also think, however, that there is sufficient ambiguity in the treaty of the text and in the law of the sea as well for the ASEAN states to come some way towards allowing that ambiguity to stand. So I just wanted to make those comments. Thank you. Um, Bill, do you have a question or comment? Thank you, John. I have a uh, kind of an observation and a question, uh, maybe two two questions that are related to an observation. I, I mean, I, I, I'm I'm pleased that uh, that Tim uh, uh, and also I think Marianne have raised the the issue of the relationship of the parties to the Bangkok Treaty uh, and the broader NAM position with respect to reservations, uh, because I think in that context, it's important to look at, uh, you know, who are these uh, Bangkok Treaty members, uh, a number of whom are very significant players within the non-aligned movement. And so I think there are kind of cross pressures at work here, uh, which may make it more difficult uh, for the states uh, in the region to, in fact, accept uh, any form of reservations. But the, the related issue here, and I, 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 here I, I'm speaking, uh, I mean, I'm drawing uh, undue parallels uh, with my own experience uh, involved in the negotiation of the Central Asian nuclear weapons free zone. But, you know, there was the 
I mean, at least in the case of the Central Asian nuclear weapons free zone, uh, there was considerable pressure among the Central Asian states to present a united front uh, in their dealings with the nuclear weapon states. But in fact, uh, kind of below the surface, there were probably far greater differences uh, within the, uh, the, the, uh, the parties to the treaty uh, than between the parties to the treaty and the nuclear weapons states. And so it would be very helpful for me, not being really a, an expert on the uh, Southeast Asia nuclear weapons free zone, perhaps to, to hear from some of the panelists about the different positions or the, the variation within uh, the, uh, the treaty uh, members in terms of uh, ways forward, because I think it's not simply a case of the, uh, the parties to the treaty versus the nuclear weapon states. And you've already kind of hinted at some variation within the nuclear weapon states. But I suspect that that variation is as pronounced also uh, among members uh, of the treaty. And so if, if anybody would, I mean, I realize this is a, a sensitive matter, a sensitive issue, uh, particularly given some of the uh, observers to this discussion, but I think it would be important to kind of try to clarify uh, the stance of, of different parties uh, uh, within the, the treaty itself. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. I think that's a, a really important issue to, to explore. Um, I would also just before asking Elizabeth, maybe you can also respond to this. I mean, for any of the speakers, do you think it will uh, change the view of the nuclear weapon states who are opposed to uh, ratifying, especially the negative security part. If this, uh, if the um, economic zones and the continental shelf provisions are removed, bearing in mind that uh, the United States and some other nuclear weapon states have not ratified the similar protocols to other treaties. I mean, will it make? Will it actually matter, Elizabeth? That one's a hard question to answer, um, but my answer to the original question does kind of touch on it, so I'm just going to go ahead with that. The question of reservations connected to effectiveness. Um, in general, I really agree uh, with your point, Dr. Hansen, about the importance of the nuclear weapons states feeling that the nuclear weapons free zone is being respected and the importance of not validating the supposed utility or goodness of nuclear weapons. Um, when it comes to reservations and their connection with effectiveness, of course, it depends on what the reservations are, but if they concern some of these maritime zone issues, I think the answer is that the impact on effectiveness isn't as large as it might seem at first. So say the reservations carved out the continental shelf part um, of the applicability of the Bangkok Treaty. That's not really a problem because the Seabed Arms Control Act extends all the way up to the territorial sea and unclosed covers the rest. It's also, the, the reason there was so much buy-in to that treaty is it's not economical or strategic to place nuclear weapons on the sea floor. The Soviet Union and United States decided that long ago. Um, and so you wouldn't lose much in terms of effectiveness to carve out the continental shelf. In terms of the exclusive economic zone, it depends on what you're talking about. When it comes to nuclear armed vessels, which especially nuclear armed submarines, there wouldn't be much practical difference because you currently cannot verify nuclear submarine transit anyway. That's that's the whole point of putting nuclear weapons on submarines, that you can't easily find them. But you are left with the concerns expressed by Dr. Chu Ping about the hazards of nuclear power and the transit of nuclear waste. So reservations regarding control over maritime space would certainly reduce the effectiveness of, of that portion of the agreement. Um, so I don't want to say more because I think there's a, a more questions on the table to be discussed. Dr. Xu Ping, please. You've been set up to, to respond. I am uh, particularly appreciative of um, um, uh, appreciate um, Elizabeth's uh, input. So re rendering the um, treaty to be less effective is definitely um, not the goal. So we also have to deal with um, the um, choices um, that will be undertaken by the nuclear weapon states, whether they choose to disarm their nuclear or not. So nuclear disarmament um, uh, has to be um, brought to the discussion as well. And as most of the nuclear um, 
weapon armed states in, in the world, uh, nine of them, uh, majority of them are actually democracy. So to what extent the leverage the public, the civilians have on their governments uh, is also a case uh, in point. In the United Kingdom, I believe, so even among the, because of the um, defense budget on maintaining the uh, nuclear arms uh, military capability, um, there is, um, so from time to time, there will be movement um, against the investment uh, into the um, um, nuclear weapons um, uh, projects and programs. However, um, the government ultimately is the um, um, policy maker and they decided to go against um, people's will in uh, maintaining and sustaining their nuclear force. So um, I think this um, type of um, um, reservations in connection to the uh, effectiveness, I would like to go back to uh, Dr. Marianne's um, point. The, strategic ambiguity. So actually the major powers doesn't like this term and it has been um, utilized a lot by the smaller states, especially in Southeast Asia. So ambiguity was being seen as um, cheating behavior, <laughs> so to say. So um, the nuclear weapons is indeed um, doesn't solve the most pressing problem at the moment, like the virus or the climate risk. So one of the way that we can improve the uh, existing protocol is to um, address the, um, sorry that I, um, um, so to, I'm sorry, I uh, just um, lost my uh, note on the screen. <laughs> so um, uh, meanwhile, I would like to hear from the others. Okay, um, Elizabeth, do you want to add more, one more element to this question before we move on? Yeah, yeah. Um, it was sparked by something that you said, and then also uh, Dr. Xu Ping earlier, uh, in terms of this question of convincing the nuclear weapon states, you know, would they really ratify the protocol if there was room for reservations or modified interpretation? And, you know, obviously the United States does not have a great track record here. They have not ratified a, a protocol since the Latin American nuclear weapons free zone. But I think um, something that Dr. Chu Ping said earlier is a really important point about the proliferation security initiative. So, uh, you know, clearly one of the strong areas of opposition from the U.S., like Russia, like the U.K., has to do with freedom of the seas and maritime transit. But the proliferation security initiative is a special multilateral agreement led by the United States. And I think 2003 it was initiated. And it, it, in a way, it's a modification of the right of visit and the right of transit. Now, my understanding is it's limited to the multilateral group of flag states that have signed on to it. But I think it's a really good potential persuasive point um, in terms of reframing the Bangkok Treaty as about critical to non-proliferation in this region, and especially maritime boarding. Um, in addition to these points about the transit of nuclear waste or, you know, concern about the, the quality of nuclear powered ships and the, the hazardous risks associated with that. Um, I, you know, I don't think that the whole approach to the treaty should be adjusted just because, you know, the United States has a particular set of issues and strategies and policies. Um, but I just thought that that was a really smart connection between this U.S. led initiative and what the Bangkok Treaty is trying to do. And, and I agree that this is about disarmament too, but the non-proliferation frame might be a more strategic and persuasive one in this context. Very interesting observation, Elizabeth. I, I would add, uh, and Dr. Potter will know who, who I'm referring to here, but a um, very respected uh, diplomat, a former boss of mine, once said, nuclear weapon free zones are about, about disarming the disarm. Uh, and I, both Bill and I vehemently disagreed with that statement. But nuclear weapon free zones, while they are framed as disarmament mechanisms, actually goes much further, as, as you pointed out. I mean, there's an environmental issue, there's dumping, there's, there's peaceful uses of cooperation, uh, but there's the non-proliferation element um, and the counter-proliferation element of that you suggested that one should explore, especially in this particular region. A very interesting observation. Thank you. Okay, let's move on to uh, the next question. How do questions of effectiveness and reservations by nuclear weapon states differ between the Southeast Asian zone 
and other nuclear weapon facilities. Um, I mean, my experience with Pelindaba was Pelindaba does not allow any reservations like most of the others. Yet uh, there's a big reservation in the in, in the zone of application, uh, the little circle around um, the um, the islands uh, of uh, that are claimed by by Mauritius and where Diego Garcia is based. So. Um, Anyone wish to lead off uh, on that question? Um, Jean, uh, I, I would only say that, I mean, it's a little bit difficult to, to make the comparison um, given that there have and there are no reservations in, in relation to the Bangkok Treaty in relation to the other nuclear weapon free zones where, where there are reservations. I mean, I think they tend to be, although there's probably a pattern uh, if one analyzed it, that the, they tend to be locally driven as it were um, in relation to situations like the one you've just mentioned, um, uh, territories of, uh, of one or other um, uh, coastal state. Um, so, I am not really sure in, in, in my own mind as to whether there's a lot to be drawn um, from that um, from one zone to apply it to another. It's it's worth uh, it's worth looking at, but I I, I don't think uh, given the complexities of the uh, of this particular zone we're looking at today that um, uh, we'll find anything of, of great help. But perhaps I'm being too pessimistic. Or you being a realist. Uh, any, any other comments on that particular question? We can always come back to it as well. Yes, please, Elizabeth. Yeah, um, just a brief one. I, I'm thinking more in the context of future potential nuclear weapons free zones rather than the ones that already exist. I mean, they're all in very difficult areas, Northeast Asia, the Middle East, the Arctic nuclear weapons free zone. Um, the, where there's more regional contestation, less cohesion. It includes the home territories of nuclear weapon states, either the P5 or other nuclear weapon states. And, you know, I don't know the answer to this, but I think it's worth thinking about the precedent that this, you know, the completion of this treaty and, you know, getting ratifications and perhaps res reservations to the protocol, um, what that means for the larger arms control agenda. Because if we want nuclear weapons free zones to continue spreading to these areas, they, they will have to be modified. They will not be able to follow the traditional model of the you know, ideal nuclear weapons free zone. And so on one hand, there's this risk of letting the nuclear weapon states you know, only participate on their own terms that are easiest for them, where they don't have to make any major changes to strategy, policy, or deployment. On the other hand, this could be sort of the step into the future of making nuclear weapons free zones feasible for these other locations. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. I think your point there, Elizabeth, is an important one that the model that we have used to establish the existing zones uh, will have to change. Uh, if you, even, even at the Middle East, it, it cannot simply be a zone that is completely free of, of nuclear weapons. They will have to be kind of um, steps put in place to lead to that. I, mean, I, would, I dare say if there would ever be a, a free a nuclear weapon free zone um, in the Korean Peninsula, including perhaps Japan, we may follow that same approach. And we'll have to come up with a new model. Uh, Bill and then Marian. Yeah, now, I think it's it's important in in talking about reservations to distinguish between the reservations that uh, the administration on the part of the U.S. may have uh, and the likelihood of ever getting uh, the U.S. Senate uh, to ratify uh, whatever uh, may be negotiated with respect to the protocol. I mean, we have the situation where, if I'm not mistaken, it was actually at the 2010 NPT Review Conference uh, when uh, the U.S. indicated that uh, the, uh, uh, the protocols would be submitted uh, to uh, the uh, U.S. Senate for ratification, uh, but they haven't been, as best I can tell. Or if they have, uh, there's been no effort to really try to secure their ratification because uh, I mean, it, you, you can't get the U.S. Senate to ratify anything 
uh, at, you know, at the moment. Um, and so, and I don't see that changing anytime uh, soon. Uh, and it's, as you pointed out, I think earlier, you know, Jean, uh, with the exception of the, uh, the uh, Treaty of Plata Loco, uh, we don't have uh, U.S. Uh, support for, for any of these, uh, of these zones. And so maybe you, you have to distinguish the, I mean, your question, I think while a reasonable one, uh, might be better directed to four of the uh, five nuclear, relevant nuclear weapon states. I think the, the U.S. case is a, is a very different one. Um, and I, I just am very, very pessimistic uh, that regardless of reservations, no reservations, that you're going to see any headway in terms of uh, U.S. Senate uh, uh, supporting this. So, um, my pessimistic take on, on the situation, at least from the U.S. standpoint. And be, thank you for being a realist, Bo, but uh, that's what the reality of me to do with. Marion, you had your hand up too. You're, you're muted, Marion. Apologies. Um, I'm just wondering how we can relate this to the broader nuclear disarmament changes that we've seen or the, the the different context that I think nuclear weapons are now being seen as. Um, we've got the TPNW, which has entered into force. We've got nine out of ten of the ASEAN states who have signed and four or five have ratified. There's, of course, the, the uh, upcoming review conference. And I think that the... the uh, this sense of sort of frustration against the nuclear weapon states is as high or higher than it's ever been at the moment. So I think that, you know, given the fact that these nuclear weapon states, they're modernizing rapidly, um, they're not themselves taking the necessary steps even to achieve the step-by-step -step process. And this this uh, ratifying this protocol would be an excellent way of manifesting some commitment to the step-by-step -step process, but they're not doing that either. Um, we've got, you know, announcements made by uh, the UK, for instance, that it is going to increase its arsenal. I think within this overall context and the real sense of frustration that the non-nuclear states are feeling, I can well understand ASEAN members saying, well, why should we water down our, our zone at all. Um, surely it's time for the nuclear weapon states to show a little bit of uh, compromise and to show good faith and, and come along with this. And I guess that relates to my other broader question, which is, you know, to what, uh, obviously nuclear weapon free zones are highly important, not just to disarmament, but also to non-proliferation. We know that. Um, and there are several states within the zone who participate in PSI as well. So that, that's a terrific link there. But by um, allowing for reservations or, or substantial reservations on the part of uh, especially the US, doesn't this simply sort of go back to what might be seen by critics as the same old strategic mindset, not being cognizant enough of the views and the security interests of small states in the international system, and in particular members of the non-aligned movement also, which of course Indonesia is a leading state. So uh, I'd be interested to hear what others think about this relationship between this particular issue um, and that, that broader changing picture of how nuclear weapons are now seen by many states. I understand the treaty is not going to bring about disarmament quickly at all, if, if ever. Um, but I'm talking about the the changed focus onto humanitarianism. I'm talking about the uh, sense that for the first time, the non-nuclear states feel that they have been empowered to make a statement about the illegality and the inhumane nature of nuclear weapons. So that's pretty important. That treaty has come into effect. It's got about 86 uh, members at the moment. How does that affect what 
any of these nuclear weapon states might do? Or are they going to sort of, you know, dig their heels in as much as, uh, as ever? Thank you, Mark. That's a really interesting question. And we have a you know, number of representatives from permanent missions, both in New York and Eva and Vienna online. And I think this would be during a, a question and answer uh, and discussion, which we need to move into shortly. But I mean, are you suggesting, perhaps I'm putting words in your mouth, that the TPNW uh, kind of leapfrogs over treaties such as nuclear weapon free zone, CTBT, FMCT, because, you know, we are prohibiting nuclear weapons. And so the commitment of non-nuclear weapon states to these step-by-step -step approaches may not be as, as deep as it used to be. I'm not suggesting that the TPNW should replace the idea of having strong nuclear weapon free zones in place, but I think it adds another layer of complexity onto this issue. Uh, who you want to comment on that? Yeah, I hope I can uh, make sense of the uh, discussion so far. And I just realized that I forgot to answer um, Professor Potter's um, question about variations. So um, basically, uh, when the um, Southeast Asia nuclear weapon free zones has been um, created, uh, it was at a time when um, Vietnam uh, invaded uh, Cambodia. And uh, we also aim to um, following the footstep of um, Zopfan, the zone of peace, um, that we aim to um, reduce um, the influence of the great powers in the region. <laughs> so of course, this is um, particularly um, uh, becoming more complicated and difficult right now, given how um, United States and China chose um, Southeast Asia as the uh, center for uh, their um, power competition. So um, even among the Southeast Asian states, um, some of us um, have developed um, nuclear um, energy research and also having a nuclear facility um, aiming to replace um, um, or to fulfill the energy um, um, utilization in the region. However, now that uh, most of us have um, um, followed TPNW, so um, a lot of domestic forces are in transition um, towards um, eliminating um, nuclear, including the peaceful use of nuclear energy in the country. So I think by serving as the president of how the smaller countries and the non-nuclear weapon state can apply this step-by-step -step approach in achieving the greater goal, um, of course, um, in integrating with other ongoing efforts like non-proliferation. So that should serve as an example. But the major powers and the nuclear armed states are, um, are going to prioritize the deterrent uh, over the nuclear safety concern um, um, and also their rights to conduct freedom of navigation, including uh, having the nuclear weapons and nuclear power ships to transit in the region. So um, all of this really um, go back to whether the um, nuclear um, armed states are willing to make the commitment to at least respect the regional um, verification process. So this can be served as a mechanism in ASEAN, for instance. So in this region, we often receive the international norms that has been applied at the United Nations level and also um, in the greater region such as East Asia. So China, Japan and South Korea always spearheading in many of those initiatives, including the very recent development on the use of AI. So Singapore, as a representation of ASEAN, has participated in the what is known as the three plus one um, um, process in making what has been set up in Northeast Asia to become a norm in Southeast Asia as well. So that is uh, undergoing currently. So which means uh, whatever that has been um, efforts ha that has been put in in Southeast Asia can also be a model. So of course, um, 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 South Korea would be particularly interested in this process. And um, of course, North Korea is now a de facto nuclear weapon state. So there is, um, instead of leap forward to denuclearization or ban the nuclear treaty, they will most likely be interested in nuclear disarmament right now. And of course, to ensure them to comply with the norms of um, non-proliferation. So I think there is um, 
a two-way traffic in terms of how we can learn from each other's experience and also to set up mechanism. So ASEAN has many mechanisms in place, such as ASEAN plus three. So I think that would be uh, one of the first steps to create, if any, um, a nuclear weapon free zones in um, Northeast Asia. So just one more comment about um, the the increasing numbers of uh, military exercise taking place in South China Sea itself, um, especially by the US and their partners. So um, that also would be having um, implications on how are we going to define um, and also to implement, verify um, the nuclear weapon uh, free zones protocols. Thank you. Okay, uh, well that set us up kind of for the final question uh, in this discussion before we open up uh, the discussion to the wider audience, is how useful has the existing dialogue between the ASEAN countries and nuclear weapons states been, and what are prospects for progress? Uh, I would also like to hear from you, including at the United Nations, and can one size fits all be applied to all nuclear weapons states? Oh, Elizabeth, sorry. Mm-hmm. Well, unfortunately, I cannot speak to the question of the usefulness of the existing dialogue, um, as I'm not an expert in um, ASEAN politics or discussions, but I, I will address the second question about one size fits all. And of course, the answer is no, one size, size does not fit all for the nuclear weapon states in this region. I think that their willingness to participate in these protocols depends fundamentally on their nuclear strategy and force structure and the relationship between those two things. When it comes to you know, reliance on nuclear armed submarines, the UK has 100%, France has 80%, and I believe the US is now at 60% of its nuclear we- weapons based on submarines. Russia and China have strategies that rely slightly more or a lot more on mobile intercontinental ballistic missile launchers. And so, so it matters, you know, what their force structure is and then also how they determine or how they interpret the conditions of nuclear deterrent strategy. So China has a minimal credible deterrence approach that creates different possibilities in terms of force structure compared to, say, the U.S. or Russian approach. And this is not at all an endorsement of these choices. Um, it is, in fact, a, an implicit answer to Dr. Hansen's earlier question about the, the possibility of normative change and sort of, a you know, 86 members of the international community signing on to a, a new significant agreement, whether or not that will influence the more realist strategies of nuclear states. When it comes to Russia, China and the United States, I just don't think we're there yet. Um, one size also doesn't fit all of the nuclear weapon states in terms of their interpretations of the law of the sea convention and the relevance of that for the Bangkok Treaty. I think it's helpful when we're moving forward in ter- terms of you know, what we can do to try and increase participation in this agreement, to think about the status of nuclear weapon states as coastal states or maritime states, coastal states being ones with large coastlines that want to protect their air- areas and their resources, maritime states being the, the major ocean users that have long distance fishing or blue water navies. The US, Russia, and China are both maritime states and coastal states. And depending on the issue and depending on the period of history, that is emphasized one or the other. And I think there are synergies here in terms of interests. So Russia, for example, would very much like to increase the restrictions on maritime transit in its exclusive economic zone in the Northern Sea Route, which is opening up in the Arctic, especially as concerns hazardous cargo. You know, we've already discussed the United States and the Proliferation Security Initiative and China's stronger interpretation of coastal state rights. So I think, you know, my bottom line here is that the law of the sea issues must be dealt with, but it's not all bad news. (laughs) That I think there are some synergies between the positions of the nuclear weapon states on, on law of the sea issues and what the Bangkok Treaty is trying to achieve. So one size does not fit all, but you it is useful to think about these different categories. That is, that is useful. Uh, Dr. Chiu Ping, you, you had your hand up. Uh, you wish to comment or was it an earlier hand? 
Uh, even though it's the earlier hand, I would like to make comments in regards to what uh, Elizabeth has raised. <laughs> so um, I think uh, what we can um, also bring in here is to navigate the dilemma that uh, exists um, between the nuclear weapon states and the non-nuclear uh, weapon states. So it is about what um, it also was part of the nuclear deterrence theory. So we have talked about this for a very long time since the Cold War era. So it's to strike the balance between restraint, uh, responsibility and also resolve. So uh, we know that it is not wise to gamble <laughs> whether the um, um, the first strike uh, uh, would be um, happening or um, uh, who will start the nuclear war first, but the nuclear processor um, must have the uh, impression that um, um, the the autonomy also comes with um, responsibility. So there is this concept uh, where uh, Marion and I was part of um, the basics on um, the British um, American um, um, uh, Security uh, Information Co Council. So this notions of um, nuclear responsibility should become a pathway for us to think about how we want to uh, formulate this type of a new norm. So that would be a um, bridge between the nuclear haves and haves not in um, um, uh, promoting this kind of dialogue among us. So I think even at the NPT review conference, we see that um, the governments always um, have those um, very big um, uh, disagreements over uh, what um, each state should or should not do. So just like what Elizabeth had mentioned just now, the law of the sea should be part and parcel of the um, discussion, but states often prefer to compartmentalize um, the security discussion rather than making connection uh, among themselves. Very true. Uh, any other comments on this particular question of kind of the way forward? Tim? So, I mean, it's interesting um, what Marianne's been saying about the uh, about the current context on the one hand and what Elizabeth's saying about, you know, the law of the sea, the, the law, the hard law, the, the important law of the sea, uh, uh, a fundamental um, security convention in its own right. And, and I mean, I think in terms of context, if, if the Bangkok Treaty were to be renegotiated today, would, would there be some um, influences from today's context in terms perhaps of winding back the references to the EEZ and the continental shelf and leaving it um, at traditional law of the sea at, uh, at uh, <clears throat> territorial sea extents? Uh, on the one hand, but on the other, the context, the humanitarian context of the impact uh, of a detonation of a nuclear weapon, either in anger or accidentally, and the uh, the extent of, of of damage that would be um, consequent would be a consequence uh, within an EZ on resources within the EZ or equally uh, on the uh, on the resources uh, on the continental shelf. And I, I don't have an answer to this, um, <clears throat> but uh, it, it, it is interesting um, to think about um, marrying, if you like, on the one hand um, today's realities with today's law. And but also with um, uh, new um, developments in terms of approaches uh, to um, uh, to dealing with um, the ultimate elimination of nuclear weapons. Thanks. Thank you, Tim. Um, very important points. Uh, any other comments on this way forward? Um, do we foresee, um, I don't know, if maybe this is a way to open up the question to the audience, um, any progress made at the United Nations? The issue is on the agenda of uh, the session of the General Assembly, um, and uh, I'm not sure whether there are any prospects. Um, so with that, I'm going to open the uh, floor and I see my good friend Jonathan Granoff is online. Hello, Jonathan, haven't seen you in a while. Uh, welcome. Um, 
So I'm going to open the floor for uh, questions from the audience. I ask that you keep your questions or comments very, very brief. Uh, we have less than 20 minutes for the seminar. Um, and so I will take um, the questions that I see. I see so far two uh, and then allow the, the panelists uh, to respond and then we'll see if there's another round. Jonathan, please go ahead. Thank you. Is there any coordinated advocacy to establish a mechanisms such an administrative body or a secretariat to amplify the advocacy of the members, now 115 nations, of nuclear weapons free zones. I think this could be important given that the NAM, which used to be a powerful voice advocating progress on disarmament, is now unable to do so. So such a coordination could also strengthen the capacity of all of the parties to pressure the nuclear weapon states to support the addition, the protocols that are so necessary. Thank you, Jonathan. A pertinent question that reminds me of the, the conference held every year on the margins of the uh, NPT review conference. And unfortunately, we've seen that very little prospects of finding a unanimity amongst those uh, parties uh, exists, but um, it certainly is. Uh, I don't know. If, uh, we'll we'll see if maybe also Amir Nasir from uh, the Malaysian uh, uh, ministry is online. And Amir, thank you very much for your contribution in making this event possible. Uh, Amir, make, please ask your question or your comment. Thank you, Mr. John Dupre, moderator. Thank you to CNS and UNODA, Dr. Bill Porter, High Representative Izumi. A uh, brief introduction. Uh, my name is Hamid from the Mission of Malaysia to the UN in New York. Malaysia is, of course, one of the countries in the region. Uh, very briefly, we're glad to hear the discussion today uh, that we start to dedicate more attention to uh, the Bangkok Treaty. Uh, obviously, there is a clear urgency for the signing and ratification of the protocol by nuclear weapon states. A uh, quick response to Dr. Marion when you mentioned about the existence of the TPNW and the NPT. Uh, I think logically uh, the level of global norms is being heightened against nuclear weapons and that momentum is seemingly continue to uh, attract more attention from time to time. Uh, my biggest takeaway uh, from today's discussion is I've heard time and again from the panelists and even in the chat function uh, the clear argument that reservations by nuclear weapon states when they sign and ratify the protocol will not affect the effectiveness of the Bangkok Treaty. I, I hope my understanding is correct. Uh, let me know if I got it wrong. Uh, my questions to the panelists. First, uh, what will be your assessment of the level of safety and security of the region of Southeast Asia uh, in accordance with the status quo of today, meaning to say that we do not have uh, the negative security assurances on the part uh, by the nuclear weapon states. So do you think nuclear threats are real against uh, Southeast Asia as a region or the threats are hypothetical? Appreciate your comments. Uh, secondly, what could uh, state parties of the Bangkok Treaty do or contribute uh, to all of the efforts to uh, generate momentum and expedite the process of signature and ratification of the protocol uh, by nuclear weapon states. Uh, very last comment, uh, we very much appreciate the initiatives and efforts of the organizers. We hope this uh, efforts will be continued uh, moving forward by UNODA, CNS and other partners. Thanks. Thank you, Amir, and also thank you, uh, for your leadership and your leadership of your, your government in this field. So we uh, look forward to collaborate in whatever way we could from, from the Center for Non-Proferation side. So we have uh, two different issues here. Um, so Jonathan Granoff asked about uh, advocacy to kind of combine the, the efforts between all the zones. Uh, and, uh, and Amir had some very specific uh, questions to the panelists. So I don't know who wished to respond first. John, um, I, I think 
dealing with Jonathan's uh, point first about the uh, the value and need for, for advocacy, I think there's always uh, uh, room for it. Um, uh, but at the moment, as you pointed out in partial response, John, it's um, it's more difficult to uh, to pull people to together in the way that they have done been done in the, in the margins of uh, NPT review conferences. Um, and nonetheless, that shouldn't um, stop trying. Uh, but I do have to say there's a practical point here, even for coordination uh, within the zones, uh, let alone uh, amongst them. And I think that's often a resources issue, at least it is in in the um, in the in the case of the Rarotonga Treaty with small, far-flung um, parties. Uh, although uh, I have to say that the, the New Zealand um, Minister for Disarmament last year um, convened a coordination um, <clears throat> commission to uh, to do precisely that within the zone. Um, it, it's to be encouraged talking beyond the zone, obviously. It's just a little bit harder um, to deliver, I think, in, in current circumstances. In, in terms of um, Amir's questions, if you want me to go on to deal with those, Sean, um, now, yes, or do you do. want? Go ahead. Um, I, I think um, uh, taking the first one, um, what would be um, uh, an assessment of of the uh, safety and security of, of the region and today if those negative security assurances had, had indeed, uh, indeed been given? It's a little hard to say. I mean, I think I'm I'm a little bit sceptical about negative security assurances, in part because I think uh, increasingly um, states are reluctant to see themselves as protected by nuclear weapons in, in any respect um, whatsoever. I mean, I think the the um, if you like the focus is gradually shifting away from protection by nuclear weapons more towards their elimination i think this is in part the context question that um that marianne alluded to um, uh, earlier so I, I, i'm sorry that's probably the, the best way that i can uh, i can answer that um, but uh, i can understand very much um, well, the point of your question particularly in, in today's troubled times um, the second um, question is what could the uh, Bangkok Treaty parties themselves do to try and um, facilitate um, <clears throat> the um, uh, <clears throat> the um, ratification, the signature and ratification uh, of the protocol? I mean, I think it's, um, as we've been saying during the course of uh, today, it's really um, talking to find uh, ways forward, practical um, ways that um, can be done to get the parties to, to to talk to one another. And maybe there are some very basic um, things such as um, taking as a starting point the recognition um, that the NPT itself gives towards the notion of uh, regional um, uh, uh, zones of uh, uh, regional weapon free zones um, to just to try and make the point that this is part of the ethos of, of the NPT as a, as a fundamental um, underpinning of, uh, of international security. Thanks. Thank you, Tim. Uh, Bill and then Elizabeth. Uh, thank you, John. I, I think that, you know, uh, Jonathan's uh, point is a really important one, and I don't have time to kind of respond to it uh, in any detail, but I, I would uh, call to uh, the uh, attention of other participants. I suspect Jonathan is already very familiar with this, but there was a, an important report uh, from a, a task force organized by the Vienna Center for Disarmament and Nonproliferation that was chaired uh, by Harold Mueller. Uh, that came out uh, in uh, 2018, which dealt specifically the question of cooperation among nuclear weapons free zones, looking at the history, the challenges and recommendations. And so there are a set of very specific recommendations that I think are very relevant to our uh, our discussion today. And I think the one uh, point that I, I re recall in particular uh, was the potential role uh, that OpenL may might play because of uh, the uh, the resources that are available in Latin America and given the history 
that they have performed in the past. So I think the, the potential for cooperation uh, is very important. And it's striking to me how underutilized this great number of, you have about 120 states that are parties to nuclear weapons free zones, that they don't collaborate more, uh, whether it's at the NPT review conference uh, in the in the first committee and elsewhere, because if they did, I think we would see far more progress uh, on the nuclear disarmament and nonproliferation front. Thank you both, Elizabeth. Yeah, thank you. I have a brief and broad response to Mr. Granoff's question. Um, coordination of 115 states sounds like a big deal, but what kind of pressure? Normative, economic, strategic pressure? I'm just not sure that normative pressure is going to do it, given how the nuclear peace movement has waxed and waned over the last 70 years. I personally just don't think that we're in a period of conceptual or normative re revolution around nuclear weapons. So I think it's time to start asking ourselves what other power a group of 115 states can wield. I have to take a more positive approach to that, Elizabeth. I, I do think that a group of 115 states, especially, and, and um, I will not venture into the age of the combined age of the panelists here, but I, I would hope that the mm -hmm. group that is online represent a, a more younger generation. And um, I do think that um, TP, uh, TPNW, nuclear weapon free zones, all these things are tools in the toolbox. And I think our diplomats and, and scholars um, need to consider how these tools can be used. There's not one perfect tool to deal with nuclear disarmament, but to simply dismiss a tool to say, this is not working because of the challenges, I think would be wrong. Um, and I do think that the combined effort, uh, you know, Many of us on this panel are, are in, in the business of education of the next generation. Um, and I do think that uh, we need to, through events like this, create awareness. And Jonathan, your point is, is, is very good. Um, but also address, uh, Amir, the, the, the diplomatic corps, uh, the younger diplomats who have made a career after all these treaties were established. Uh, and are kind of faced with the challenges that they inherited from, from the negotiators of the treaty. So they have to figure out ways to make the thing work, even though they were not part of the, the original um, treaty uh, environment. So uh, I do think that uh, we should look at this as opportunities for new fresh minds to come with, with ideas. Are there any other questions from the audience? Before I ask uh, our uh, panel each to make very brief final remarks. I see no hands up at the moment. So, ah, um, Xinjiang, okay, you wish to ask a question? Um, Hello. Yes. Thank you very much, Mr. Priest, for giving me the floor. And good afternoon, dear colleagues. Uh, this is Xinjiang speaking. I'm from the Chinese mission to the United Nations in New York. Uh, I really wish to skip the uh, canned words, but I have two. First, thank you, the UNODA and the CNS for uh, co-organizing this very important and helpful event. Uh, and it's always a great pleasure for me to hear the ideas of Dr. Porter, as well as other distinguished speakers. Uh, I will be very brief, just one clarification and one update. So first, on the Southeast Asia nuclear weapon free zone, China has resolved all pending matters with the ASEAN countries on the protocol uh, to the Bangkok Treaty, of course, including the EEZ issues. As for China's openness for uh, signing the protocol, if it opens for signature, this is nothing but uh, China's consistent position. We have always been supporting international efforts to uh, establish nuclear weapon free zones and you all know that China is the only nuclear weapon state which undertakes unconditionally not to use or threaten to use nuclear weapons against non-nuclear weapon states or nuclear weapon free zones and we have signed and ratified all protocols 
to the treaties on nuclear different zones, which are open for signature, and has faithfully fulfilled relevant uh, obligations. And my update is that in the P5 Beijing conference in January of 2019, the P5 uh, has expressed their readiness to renew engagement with the parties to the treaty. And since then, this topic has remained on the agenda of the P5 and exchanges among the P5 and between the P5 and uh, ASEAN countries is still ongoing. Uh, as Dr. Porter rightly pointed out, there are different views among treaty parties as well among nuclear weapon states. But for China, we will continue to help resolve the long-standing differences around the matter of reservation on the basis of uh, adhering to the established consensus. Uh, we hope this protocol could be open for signature at an early date, and we will continue to stay in communication and coordination with relevant parties. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jason. Um, that's a good way to move to the conclusion of our of our webinar, uh, we received some positive news, and thank you very much uh, for that. Um, I'm going to ask in uh, sort of reverse order uh, for our panelists to make very, very brief concluding remarks, if you so wish. Um, Dr. Xi Ping. I would like to say that um, the state should put aside their differences and their insistence on their rights to um, navigation, to um, um, self-defense, deterrent, so that we can um, jointly um, starting the conversation about um, the uh, new norm that we are trying to create. And in regards to um, the um, nuclear weapons um, free zones, um, the sense of um, um, uh, the, the need to have um, every state to um, um, pick up their responsibility is um, very important. And I uh, would like to comment on uh, what uh, um, Dr. Duperez has um, said about the dialogues between the senior officials and the uh, next generation uh, professionals is very important. So I uh, was um, uh, consulting a former uh, Malaysian nuclear agency's um, officer who was among the first batch of um, the country's talent being sent to the U United Kingdom to acquire um, a PhD in um, nuclear physics. So um, even though now um, our government has decided to prohibit the nuclear weapons, he went on to become the consultant and advisors to um, other nuclear related agencies, including um, in nuclear safety, nuclear policy and um, consultation works. So I hope uh, by bridging the um, uh, perception gaps between the um, senior generation and the next generation, uh, we can generate more ideas um, to to uh, bring this uh, issue forward. Thank you. Thank you. A very positive uh, message. Um, Dr. Hilson. Yes, um, I think my overall position is, while I acknowledge the complexities, especially with the uh, extended continental shelf, I personally think that the nuclear weapon states need to step up here. I think that there have been sufficient changes in the international system regarding the legitimacy of nuclear weapons. And I, I frankly um, think that the non-nuclear weapon states are no longer willing to accept uh, the, the very sort of hard and fast position of most of the nuclear weapon states. So I do think that the um, the details can be addressed. I think this is something that can be done. I feel that the nuclear weapon states ought to show good faith and do it without putting in a pile of reservations, frankly. And I'd be delighted if China led the way on that because for no nuclear weapon state to have signed the protocol 25 years later, is uh, that's a very poor record, I think. Here, here to that, uh, Dr. Menhall. Yes, thank you. Um, so the law of the sea issues that are associated with maritime transit and involved in the Bangkok Treaty, so transit passage through straits, 
innocent passage through the territorial sea and restrictions on passage in the exclusive economic zone. All of these issues are, are being or can be worked out in the context of ocean governance. Um, and I just think that investing in consensus building in these areas can be um, part of the larger solution set um, that you alluded to earlier, Mr. Dupreeze, in terms of improving the conditions for investment in the Bangkok Treaty and other forms of nuclear arms control. Um, I just want to end by expressing my genuine gratitude to the organizers and other panelists. This has been a very enriching event, and I am honored to have been a participant. Thank you for your participation and contribution. Tim. Well, thanks very much, Sean. Um, I think the bigger picture is that there are at least four ways in which the commitment by zonal states to establish and maintain zones free of nuclear weapons contribute to regional peace, stability, and cooperation. I mean, they help reduce nuclear risk regionally and globally. Uh, by renouncing um, nuclear weapons as an instrument of, of statecraft in a region. They strengthen uh, also nuclear non-proliferation uh, efforts at regional and global levels. And um, they, they, they should um, build confidence and cooperation among states of the region. And I think it, it's worth that these general points are, are borne in mind uh, as the uh, Bangkok treaties um, move towards drawing the nuclear weapon um, states uh, into their um, arrangement. Thanks. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Bill, would you like to have the last word? <laughs> okay. Thank you, uh, Jean. Uh, and let me uh, thank the panelists for what I thought really was a, a superb uh, uh, exchange of, of views. I mean, as, as some of you know, I, I tend not to be an optimist uh, on most fronts, including uh, nuclear disarmament, non-proliferation, um, and I, I could make a, you know, probably a, a rather uh, uh, kind of pessimistic statement with respect to uh, the future of nuclear weapons-free zones. But I would conclude perhaps by noting that in the scheme of things, uh, I think nuclear weapons-free zones uh, are probably more likely to succeed than most other approaches that we have been pursuing to date. And so I think that the discussion today has, you know, pointed out some paths forward. Uh, certainly, have suggested some uh, ideas that uh, merit more attention. And I would certainly hope uh, that at the fourth uh, international conference of nuclear weapons-free zones parties, uh, that they are able to get their act together, uh, so that rather than fighting amongst themselves, they can promote uh, the approach of nuclear weapons-free zones. Uh, to other parties uh, in advance of the uh, next NPT review conference. So I think we've taken a step forward in that regard uh, through our discussions today, and I'm very grateful uh, to all of the participants. And thank you, Jean, for, uh, for organizing and moderating the discussion uh, in collaboration with UNODA. Thank you very much, Dr. Potter, and I would like to then uh, conclude the webinar by thanking uh, Ambassador Tim Corley, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Mendenhall, uh, Dr. Marion Hansen, uh, Dr. Uh, Chi Ping Hu, uh, and of course, Dr. William Potter, and uh, in her absence, uh, the High Representative uh, for Disarmament Affairs. And we look forward to seeing you in similar forum. Good afternoon, good evening, and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>